How are you this morning? We need to have flowers in our office all the time because we're very important. Lilies make me Lilies make me feel a little sick. Lilies make me feel a little sick sometimes. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Right now they haven't yet. It's just as they as they go. Why I got to our new VR people? What? The new VR people in Story County that we have. We have two new counselors up there. We're taking swag up to them tomorrow. There you are. Like your jeans on. Yeah, I watched. Well, I tried to look presentable, even though I have a sweatsuit on. I have jewels. I know. Oh, nobody can see anything about the like right here, which is probably good. I don't know what it's going to be like when we actually have to dress dress for work, like wear pants. When we don't feel like it. No, it's Friday. I know, right? And so when I go to let people in, what happens? Um, I will log on so you can see what it's like. Oh, okay. I got logged in by myself, though. I'll be really glad when my bottom teeth come because they show when I talk or. I'm really self conscious. I feel you. I've had no front tooth for. How come you have little bumps all over your face this morning? Do I? Yeah. Well, have the crud. I didn't know I had bumps. I put moisturizer on. My dog was so happy to see me last <laughs> night. He just didn't know what to do with himself. We snuggled. And then in the middle of the night, I had left my uh, windows open last night and I had my ceiling fan on. And so the middle of the night got a little chilly. Oh, and so oh, he snuggled yeah. up with me under the covers. And he, he loves my, I have a pink body pillow that's fuzzy. It's pink and it's fuzzy. And he loves the pink body pillow. So he had his head on the pink body pillow and was, yeah. So. what I had for supper last night that tasted really good oatmeal don't you ever just get in the mood for like oatmeal or something mm -hmm. weird like that just like oatmeal. Okay, here. oh I love oatmeal I like blueberry that's my favorite or plain oatmeal with like fruit on top I like so <sighs> Yeah, it says participants too. So what do I have to do to let you oh, in? Oh, it didn't make you let me in? No. I'm still under Laura Gibson. Yeah. Oh, up here. Laura Gibson oh. entered the waiting room. I like this control thing. <laughs> So I printed fun. off um, the description. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Good. Can you read it so that, why am I echoing? So that I don't have to show my teeth. I'm really self conscious yeah. right now. Okay. I'll do it when I get my teeth on the 24th, then I'll take over. Yeah, mm -hmm. Trish sent me out an entire. Um, layout of how things are go how things go which i thought was very interesting what kind of coffee cake is that raspberry oh yum
raspberry, raspberry coffee cake. Oh, Brenda left me my cup. This is my cup. She hasn't cleared out any of her shit. Oh, I know, but she better not take that cup because my sister gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And I would not be happy with her. Just okay. saying. So did you get that out there? But today I'm going to drink water. Okay. Did you buy us more apples yesterday? Mm -hmm. oh. <clears throat> Next time it's my turn to buy the fruit. Oh, I like the purple mask. Thanks. How many masks do you own? Um, like as a family or just me? Just you. Because I've seen you in several. Probably eight. Paul likes the white ones. Our white ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he likes them. Okay, let me see if I can find my email she just sent me. God, it's kind of creepy. Okay, I need to save it to my dashboard. Is that what you said? To your desktop. Or my desktop. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're just teaching me all kinds of fun stuff. I actually like... Um, Okay, now what do I do? Okay, so then under just a second, I gotta get back. Where do I go? On Zoom. Oh. The camera on the oh thank you. So then see the little up arrow next to the stop video? Mm -hmm. Choose virtual background. <gasps> you are just fabulous. Yeah, and then you hit the plus sign over on the far right. Add image. And then you upload wherever you saved it. And there you are <gasps> on the bridge. I sure am. Yep. I don't have to do anything else. Nope. Yeah, I feel like I could climb like, <laughs> oh, what's this though? It's like, why is it doing weird stuff in the background? Because we don't have a green screen. So if you don't stay kind of close then it. I don't know what parameters it's supposed to use. How close do I have to get? Like, stick my face in that. What would be ideal is if we bought, like, a green screen tarp tablecloth. Yeah. Okay. See, I think I'll put a waterfall in there later today. I feel really weird looking at you in the screen when you're sitting right next to me. It's a little awkward. Interesting. Your chap lips. I'm sorry. I don't know if the chapsticks that ran somewhere. Glad you don't have a picture of me in my bathing suit behind you in Florida. That would be a little embarrassing. Well, it could be arranged. No, but it could be fun. I think we need to be like on top of a mountain somewhere, like standing somewhere. My lips are really chapped. From wearing that lipstick, the lip liner yesterday. It pays me not to wear lip liner. <sighs> I can make my bun disappear. See? Watch. Wait a minute. <laughs> but it doesn't take much to entertain me. Did you notice that? Huh? 
I may have, yeah. Okay. Can check. What's the CR stand for? That must be on the sign behind us. It's the work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or back. Mm -hmm. Okay, or back. I wonder if I can make this look skinny. I call it eat my head. Oh, that's actually a better angle because you moved around a little bit and it didn't. I, I think I need a neck lift. Or something left. I don't know what I need. I'm looking pretty young in this, though. I don't look as old. Kind of like in my appearance here. Kind of like in my appearance today. Yeah, uh, that's not as much fun to put something behind me. Ooh, I like that one. I want to be there. Right there by that underneath that tree. Oh, three people are waiting. Whoops. Okay, so do I let them in? I need to fix mine. That looks good. Morning. How are you? I'm here. Hello, Mr. Matt. Hello, Matt. Oh, can you not hear us? He's, he's on mute, but. Matt, can you hear us? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go, cool. Hi. Okay. I like the background. Except yeah, we, see where Laura's background is. I want to be under that palm tree. Yeah. Don't we all? We have, I, you know, I sure hope you're taking a vacation once things you get help. We, yeah. Uh, once yeah. Help. Well, we're going, we rescheduled our Hawaii trip that was supposed to happen last year. So that'll uh I'm pretty sure I can't see any reason probably why that won't happen. So we'll have that. I That's have good. a wedding in, in Florida for over the weekend in July. And then of course, Cole will go off to college. So wherever he ultimately ends yeah. up. Yeah. Has he made a decision yet? No, the offer or the, the acceptances don't come in until, unless they're early acceptance, which he got mm -hmm. for Kentucky state. He's got that early acceptance, but, um, not until the end of March, April. Mm, gotcha. So we'll find out soon, but he's had uh, an interview with Stanford. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I don't really know what his, um, what his favorite is. He applied to 12, 13 colleges. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And none of them are local. We're all either in California or I think Michigan is is what his favorite is. I'm like, oh, the weather. Why? Why? But um, yeah, I think Michigan might be his favorite, but he won't tell us. I think it's that disappointment thing. If he doesn't yeah. get in, he doesn't want everybody to know what. So we'll see. It's still very exciting. Well, yes and no. I, it'll be weird not having him home after 18 years yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah so we have 26 that are registered so okay. but we want to you know so just so everybody knows we're, we're probably going to get started about 8 35 just to give time for everybody to to get logged in um or actually i'm sorry it was like 29 um so yeah okay yeah Matt, have things slowed down for you there at the bank? Uh, yes and no. So uh, PPP, basically, we don't get it in this week or next week. Um, yeah, my PPP slowed down. Uh, trying to um, mortgage pipelines good. Um, so yeah, so yes and no. Uh, it slowed down in certain areas. Other areas, it seems like it's picking up, so... I saw somebody make a comment the other day, and I know that they, it must be just the way they worded it about PPP, but they said 
Um, has anybody applied for the second round? Is that, it, that there's not yet a second round of the second round, is there? No. Um, so really kind of how that plays out or the way that I understand it. And again, it's all about how you understand it is there's been three funding rounds. Okay. So there was one in April, they ran out of money. So they extended that. So they put more money into that one. And then this one. And so if you call, so if you applied for uh, the first draw in the first or second round, you can apply for what's called a second one in this round. Gotcha. Okay. I, I figured it was just the way they worded that, but so will they, do you think they'll, if there's still a lot of money out there that they will open it up again, that people can apply for more or no? So one thing I realized with the PPP is it is, has to, like, it's a law. Uh, it's part of a uh, package uh, that the Congress needs to approve. And then the uh, president needs to sign off on. So really, um, things, as you can tell, things change quite frequently, like the stimulus package that's come, that just got, will be signed today or tomorrow. Uh, it took a long, well, not a long time, pretty fairly quickly, but there was a lot of changes to it. So until I, till someone inks it, till the president inks it, no clue. You're giving me a hug. Right. And you know, it's if you open Mickey Mouse, which would you prefer? <laughs> oh, somebody, funny. somebody needs to mute themselves if they're talking in a different. Oh, sorry. Oh, that would right. be Laura and I. Oh, nice guys. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, the whole, yes, the PPP. One thing that I did get as a package and what we're going to be going through it is you know, it's really that breakdown and I'm sure you've gotten it too, Matt, but it's a breakdown into like a pie shape that shows where this new stimulus package is going to be going. So, you know, whether it's in uh, stimulus checks or whether it's in childcare or whether it's in unemployment, but it's really interesting. And I think that nonprofits should look at that because if, if your nonprofit falls under that area, this is money that's going to be available in the form of grants and, and whatnot. We know that sometimes things are really confusing with the government and how that rolls out and who's getting that money so that you as a nonprofit could go and try to apply and get some of it. But yeah, the industries where they broke it down are really, really interesting. So make sure you're watching that um, and uh, make sure you're getting any of that funding that you can as, as it's coming out. So yeah. All right, what do we well. got? We're at 12. Yeah, and we, again, we've got like 29 and people will just pop on. Some yeah. people will pop on just for the presentation. So why don't you go ahead and get started? Bronnie. Okay. Um, my name is Bronna Craze and I'm the Director of Programs with Central Iowa Center for Independent Living, um, known as CISL. We support individuals um, who have disabilities um, in obtaining and maintaining employment amongst other things. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the nonprofit forum. Um, also want to induce, introduce Matt. Um, Matt, you want to tell us about what's going on at West Bank? Yeah, so I just wanted to, uh, so thanks. I, one of the things that we're doing, West Bank is being the premier sponsor for this, and that's really great. So I really, really appreciate that. One thing I just kind of want to bring up is that as it stands right now, the SBA needs to approve uh, paycheck protection loans by uh, the end of this month. And it's not when it's submitted to the SBA, it's when they approve it by the way that it stands right now. So what's going to be really important is in the next couple of days, if you haven't applied, you need to apply. Or if you are put on a, like a hold status, you'll need to get those documents to the banks as soon as possible. That way you can ensure that you will get this round of funding. Again, uh, I know there's a lot of lobbyists that are trying to either extend it or say that it's a submission date, not the approval date. So again, everything is always changing and pretty fluid with the PPP. So that's one thing is if you have not done that yet uh, and you want to do it or need to do it, I would get on it this week. Okay. Um, are things slowing down or picking up at West Bank right now? Uh, the PPP is slowing down. We had a pretty good wave, uh, probably about 50% of the people that applied for the mm -hmm. first qualified for this round, which is a reduction of 25% in revenue 
uh, comparable to the same quarter in 2020 as in 2019. So that's slowed down. Mortgage rates, um, they're kind of, uh, they're going up just a little bit, not bad, but some, but it's uh, purchase season. So we're getting a lot of uh, purchases in. So staying busy with that. You know, I have to make a quick note here just because we were laughing about it. Um, you know, full disclosure, recently Matt did a refinance for my husband and I, but my husband informed me um, that he had has been playing with stocks. You know, he retired recently from the police department. So he's sitting around with nothing to do and he's playing with stocks on this like Charles Schwab. You just sit around all day yeah. and, and, you know, move your stuff around. Anyway, I just had to laugh, Matt, because last night he's like, you'll never believe the amount of money we made on the West Bank stock. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. I didn't it's been even. year in banking. Um, it's been an interesting year in banking, but because yeah. of the support from the government and the stimulus packages and us playing a big part in the PPP, it's been a really actually good year. And we haven't had a lot of loan well, our cre uh, credit uh, bank-wide uh, at West Bank, I can't speak for the industry as a whole, is really, really good. Um, so we haven't, we're kind of, I think a lot of banks are a little nervous about what's going to happen in the next 12 months with, with their loans. But yeah, no, we had a very good 2020. Good. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're going to um, just talk about or introduce ourselves and then tell us what's going on that's positive in your, in your businesses. Um, or any little struggles you might be having right now. We're kind of, we're in between that shift of COVID and still not quite together yet. So it's kind of a difficult time for most of us. So Trish, you want to go ahead and get things started? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I'm Larry Barnes, I'm the president of Fuse DSM. So welcome everybody. We appreciate um, you being here and, and your patience as, as we start navigating back to in-person. So just an update there. We will probably be aiming for May, um, fingers crossed. There's no guarantee, but we're, we're, the reason we're not gonna try for April, even though things seem to be opening up a little bit, is there seems to be a lot of worry out there from spring break. You know, Are we gonna have a few weeks afterwards where the numbers are gonna rise and that mm -hmm. would take us right around that April time. So um, we are gonna aim for May. In the past, these were held in person, but I will tell you that the attendance um, for the nonprofit has grown quite a bit than in the past. So in the past, they were held at LifeServe. We will not be able to do that there. Um, I mean, we may only get 15 in the room, but, um, but the problem is, is we don't want to tell anybody no. So we want to get a larger location and make sure that we're being safe and, and um, um, being able to socially distance. So again, just stay tuned for that. So aim, uh, May is our target for that. Um, okay. and, and the same with our other events within, within the chamber. The monthly luncheon is, is aiming for May. Um, pretty much everything will stay online in April, but we have some great things happening out there that apply for nonprofits too, uh, our events. Um, one I want to point out is the Feed Your Mind series in, I think it's the 24th of April is um, on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is one of those, you know, gold mines that most of us don't use very well. So we've got somebody that's gonna be coming in and telling us how he succeeds at it. Uh, it's Jacob Rep, and he does succeed at it. So yeah, that's it from the chamber. Okay. Um, Heidi Kroll, you wanna go ahead? Hey, I'm Heidi. I'm the executive director for Community Hand Up. Um, yeah, been completely unproductive the last month, so. Eh. Not really a whole lot to report. <laughs> for those who don't know what your agency does, can you just give us a brief description? So we help families um, with emergencies. Um, their income has, they cannot, we help families who do not qualify for government assistance with emergencies. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk because I'd like to see how we can partner with CISL. So we, okay. we get a lot of people like that. Um, let's see, Garrett Shepard. Hello. Sorry, I was on mute. I couldn't hit it. How That's you doing? Okay. Good. How are you? Doing pretty good. 
Uh, what was the question I just got on? Just let us know or introduce yourself, who you're with, and then just something great that's going on right now in your agency. Perfect. Um, well, I'm Garrett with Hard to Love. Uh, we help at-risk populations gain their lives back through a 12-week fitness nutrition regimen that incorporates not only strength and conditioning, but yoga and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, cooking classes. Uh, we had our first one last night. It went great. Uh, a money master's program and a job skills program. And something great, uh, we actually went down and uh, created a new partnership uh, as of yesterday and are looking forward to expanding on that in May. Great, great. Um, Heidi. Hi, good morning. I'm Heidi Goykovich with the Waukee Schools Foundation. Um, we are working on a virtual event right now for April. Um, we are going to roll that out shortly. So it's kind of a busy time and this comes at a, this webinar comes at a perfect time for us. <laughs> nice to see you all. Um, let's see, who else do we have? Jane? Good morning. Uh, my name is Jane Jeffries. I am the director of Stowe Heights, which is under the umbrella of Community Youth Concepts here in Des Moines. Um, it's located on the east side behind Stowe Elementary, hence the name. And um, I'm just excited to be, yesterday, last year was meant to be our inaugural year. <clears throat> Pardon me. And of course, COVID hit. So we are launching this summer um, and everything is happening at once. So that's a, that's a highlight, a positive and a struggle right now is that there are lots of, um, lots of hiring, training, booking, um, staffing that's all happening at once <laughs> um, and keeping up with um, online promotion. And so that's why I'm on here right now because I feel like I um, thought I was technologically savvy, but <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Jordan Maines. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Maines. I am a marketing and development coordinator with Everybody Wins Iowa. Um, so for those who are not familiar with us, we are a reading and mentoring nonprofit uh, here in central Iowa. So it's kind of been a crazy year for us. Uh, been, we've been doing basically everything virtually. Uh, for next month, we're working on a virtual trivia event. Um, next month, or uh, yeah, next week is spring break for uh, our kids. So we're kind of working on uh, wrapping up this crazy school year, so. Um, let's see, where am I at? Uh, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Ligas with Everybody Wins Iowa. Everybody wins when you read with a child. Um, and as Jordan said, uh, we're gearing up for an online trivia event. We've held a trivia event usually with a a local uh, brewery um, in April every year for about five or six years now. And so unfortunately we'll not be in person, but um, we're hoping that that will be a fun event despite having to be online. And then as Jordan also mentioned, it's spring break. So we are phonetically getting books out in the hands of kids at all of the programs that we serve. Um, we're down. Uh, normally, uh, we've been in the 600 students served by this point of the year, um, and we're a little shy of 500 this year. So um, we're in four uh, counties in central Iowa. So anyway, that's us. Thank you. Um, Laura, you want to give us an update? Sure. I'm Laura Gibson. I am executive director of CISL, Central Iowa Center for Independent Living. Um, good things we have going on. We're trying to get some PPE out to folks, um, specifically who are working with people with disabilities. And we are gearing up to um, kind of increase our peer support program, which I'm looking forward to, and just kind of figuring out what we're doing for the rest of the year. So your biggest win is that you are now the executive director and no longer the interim. So that yeah, happened. Yeah, and I more. still, I keep wanting to say director of operations. So I have to switch up my mouth. It's exciting. Congratulations. It is. Thank you. 
Um, Lindsay. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Lemaire. I'm the VP of strategy at WebSpec and one of the presenters today. Um, good things we have going on here. Uh, we have started to see some people kind of trickle back into the office, which has been really nice. Um, we also are hiring quite a bit. Uh, so we're in growth mode again, and uh, we're kicking off our first internship program uh, this summer. So that'll be very exciting. Um, and for those of you don't, who don't know, we'll dive into this a little bit more, but WebSpec's located in Urbandale um, and we do design development and marketing. Thank you so much. Glenn, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself. Why? Sure. Right after her. Hi everyone, I'm Glenn Martin, uh, Director of Digital Marketing at WebSpec, another one of the presenters today. Um, like Lindsay said, we're in growth mode again. The last year was a little bit stagnant uh, as it was with everybody, but uh, we're hiring, we're picking up new uh, accounts, new clients, um, existing clients are growing as well. So that's just really exciting to see. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, who else? Marcel? Hi, good morning. It's Marisol Molstry. I'm with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach in Polk County. I typically don't attend the nonprofit forums. You'll hear from Paul here in a few minutes. Um, but uh, as a marketing strategist there, we have a lot of um, exciting things coming up with COVID uh, kind of allowing a lack of COVID, allowing us to um, start implementing more of our programs. Um, a lot of our staff are wrapping up kind of their first um, series of educational programs from like January till spring break. Mm -hmm. uh, we offered a virtual kids in the kitchen series. Um, we also offered uh, a leap into literacy programming. We're uh, all done virtually. We have our uh, 4-H programming that uh, clubs are still getting together and we've offered um, education and opportunities for club leaders to, to meet virtually. So we have a lot of exciting things going on and we're starting to plan for summer and hopefully um, Polk County Fair as far as 4-H is concerned, hopefully we can have a more uh, traditional experience for our kiddos. So, and I'll let Paul talk to, to more of our other exciting things. So excited to hear from the web spec folks and also from the marketing perspective, I joined today because I just, we're trying to amp up our digital, our digital game a little bit and reporting on digital. So, um, I'll be anxious to hear a little bit more about that. Paul, why don't you go ahead? Sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, Paul Gibbons, I'm regional director here for Iowa State Extension in Polk County. Um, well, Marisol, I mean, there's, uh, we have programming everything from training pesticide applicators, which we actually rented a space next to Cecil on the bottom floor of, of the mall for a while mm -hmm. until the governor mm -hmm. shut us down and sent us to you know, to being virtual, as it's it so turns out. We, boring I'm without sorry. you here. I'm sorry. I mean, we would have loved to have stayed. It would have been a whole lot easier. We had that all set up. And actually, as it turns out, um, we had almost a record breaking year in terms of the number of pesticide applicators we, we provided. So we ended up with a socially distanced space that could accommodate 75 people, um, which we cannot do in our office. Um, our office remains closed to the public. Um, we have hired our summer interns. We're gearing up for summer programming. Um, our staff's done a great job of doing everything like Marisol said, from teaching cooking to teaching about farmland management to uh, working with youth, working with families. Uh, we've got mental health aspects that we're working on in terms of uh, being mindfulness um, and just a wide variety of ways that we're trying to support. So we do things both virtually um, and online. So synchronous and asynchronous. Um, but I'm really proud of the staff as they're planning for their second spring session. We're looking at potentially working with between 150 and 200 youth um, through that online portal. So it does provide us a unique opportunity. Um, as a relatively small staff, we've got about seven programmers that go out across Polk County mm -hmm. to be able to serve that many people, um, just youth at one time is um, really pretty amazing. So, uh, but we really need to, you know, again, you know, we're in this huge market here in Polk, we're all in that market. And so the more we can learn about how better to uh, advertise and promote what we do, the better off we're all gonna be. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see, who else haven't I gotten, Rachel? 
Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rachel. I am the Chief Operations and People Officer at Blank Park Zoo. Um, we have a lot going on as we're preparing for spring break next week and um, launching our very first uh, Wild Lights Festival that you may have seen commercials or heard about in some medium. Um, we actually have a shipment, another shipment of lanterns arriving today. So if you have the opportunity and want to kind of see what they're going to look like, we have already um, a whole collection of them out throughout the zoo grounds and they're really pretty impressive even during the day. So we're super excited um, for what that's going to look like when we get to nighttime events. Um, next week we have a Shamrock and Shells uh, St. Patrick's Day event happening. It's very limited ticket supply. So it will be kind of an exclusive um, night out, adults only. So if somebody is looking for something to do um, without kiddos, um, it'll be a really great socially distance event. Um, we're gonna have some fun animal interactions happening and trivia and a lot of other fun activities. So um, hopefully weather will cooperate because as we're approaching spring break, we're starting to see that the weather doesn't wanna stay like it has been the last mm -hmm week when it's been fabulous yeah anyway we have tons going on lots of hiring so if you know of anyone um, looking for seasonal work uh, we we hire tend to hire a lot of uh, teachers and students and retirees in the summertime um, but if you know of anyone looking now is when we're really you know ramping up our hiring so um, please send people our way okay did I miss anybody uh you missed I think oh. Kate with Anna Wim is sorry about that <laughs> nope and then Annie just yeah, I just thought, yeah. Um, that's okay. Um, I'm Kate Bergeron with Anawim Housing. I do marketing, so that's why I wanted to jump on this meeting. Um, and, and we have a lot of stuff going on with within with our programs um, through Anawim. We have a rapid rehousing program that we just received um, our second round of funding for. So we're housing a lot of people who became homeless due to COVID who can't get work easy so we're we've got all these new programs we have a youth homeless opportunities program we've started and we have a social enterprise um, workforce program the renew crew so we're kind of doing a lot of that we're not doing a lot of events so um, i'm just interested to hear more digital marketing tools tips and tricks that we can help to stay connected to people great and annie you want to give us introduce yourself and just give us an update? Sure. Um, I'm Annie Judicesi. I own Hey Jude Communications, which is a social media marketing company. I work with small businesses and nonprofits, including the Chamber, and I sit on CISL's board. So um, I often come to these to learn things so I can be a better board member to Laura and Brana. Thank you. <laughs> And we appreciate her too. Um, Laura, I'm gonna, I, everybody, I had some dental work done and so my speech is a little bit off. So Laura's gonna do the introductions cause it's gonna be easier for her to talk than it would be for me. So <laughs> Laura, you wanna go ahead and do our introductions to our speakers today? Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, we have Lindsay Lemaire, Vice President of Strategy. When Lindsay graduated from Iowa State with a degree in English, she had no idea that it would lead her to a career in digital marketing, especially since web design ended up being her least favorite class. Her background in technical communication serves her well when creating digital marketing campaigns for the wide range of industries that we see at WebSpec. Since she joined the team in 2013, she has seen her career in SEO grow into a passion. Her skills and love for search marketing eventually led to a selection as a finalist for Young Search Professional of the Year in 2015 U.S. Search Awards. When she's not managing the creative side of the business, Lindsay loves teaching fitness classes at Power Life, traveling around the world, and cheering for the Cyclones. Go Cyclones. Um, and then we have Martin, Director of Digital Marketing. Glenn Martin, excuse me. Glenn grew up primarily in Ames and graduated from the University of Iowa with a double major of Russian and linguistics. During high school and college, he studied abroad in the Czech Republic and in Moscow. Prior to joining WebSpec, he worked at a large tech company, 
dealing with domains, websites, and servers, ending up in a training role teaching others. In his free time, Glenn enjoys cooking, traveling, reading, and spending time with his wife and dogs, Tamari and Boris. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Lindsay, are you starting this off or Glenn, are you starting this off? Yes, we have any screen sharing capabilities. Okay. Just a second. So you make her a co-host. Where do I do that? Hold on for a minute. Um, can you click on your picture in the little dots in the corner? Um, make a co-host. Yep. Should be good to go. You should be good to go. Awesome. Okay. okay. Yep. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. Glenn and I are so excited to be presenting to the nonprofit forum. Um, <clears throat> we really wanted to focus on the topic of maximizing your marketing this month. Um, not doing everything, but maximizing what you're already doing. So a lot of what we'll cover today are free tools that you can use uh, to help kind of get the most out of what you're doing. Um, we know that working with nonprofits, there's small teams, small resources, everyone's wearing a lot of hats. Um, and that's why we want to talk about actually getting the most out of what you're doing rather than trying to do everything. It's a really quick introduction. I mentioned earlier that we're WebSpec. Um, we've got about 55 team members. We're based in Urbandale, but we also have a satellite office in Chicago. And with the pandemic, we've actually expanded and have employees in several different states across the country, which has been really exciting. Um, and we specialize in design development and marketing. Uh, we work with organizations all the way up to the state of Iowa. We're a master vendor for them as well. And we also have a master vendor contract with Iowa State. Uh, we also work with a lot of small businesses and nonprofits. So really our specialty is just tailoring every, everything we do for the individual organization. So here's a quick overview of what we'll cover today, really focusing on maximizing what you're doing, managing your content on your website, uh, getting the most out of your SEO, leveraging some free tools. And then at the very end, lucky you guys will dive into going over some website questions and audits. That's partially a benefit of us being virtual. Uh, everyone can pull up their website and kind of walk along side by side with some of the stuff that we talk about. And you also get a couple you know, takeaway tools after this too. So highly recommend you pull up your website and just follow along, um, come up with questions that we can talk about at the end. So a lot of times we start our meetings off with a win or something positive, which is so great, but sometimes you also just want to acknowledge like the, the struggle, the grind. So when it comes to managing your website and marketing, what are some of your biggest struggles? We're a smaller group today, so you guys can shout it out. You can also put it in the chat, but I kind of want to start off with, let's be honest, what are some of the biggest struggles that you guys have with your marketing and your website? Uh, Lindsay, um, this is Jane Jeffries with Stowe Heights. Um, I was getting in a groove <clears throat> at the beginning of the pandemic, and then there was a gap in in updating my website, and now I feel like I'm back at square one to learn it again. Um, and so my challenge is the gaps in frequency of updating my website, and then needing to relearn it, <laughs> and the time that that takes. Okay. We use Wix, and so I'm doing that on my own, and um, and I like the website, but that's one of my challenges is the the time consumption. Definitely. And Paul, thanks for putting that in the chat. He said targeting particular audiences can be a real challenge. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Anybody else have any other struggles? Cool. Ponder those as we go. 
Oh, sorry. This is Trish. I got. I'm. I was. We we're trying to get somebody into the um, into logged on, but I did. You know, one of the things because we the chamber we're a nonprofit as well, but we're a five hundred one c six. But um, we have a you know fantastic um, small business that that handles our website and and marketing. But one of our biggest struggles is simply that the way that we did things in the past. You know, we. Um, send out emails. Email was our primary, is our primary way of, of reaching our membership. And uh, the open rates have gone down, the, um, you know, the, all of the analytics, and, and it's not just us, it's, it's across the board, businesses across the board, the analytics on social media, you know, whether that's because people are distancing themselves from it. Um, but yeah, that's a big struggle. You know, what is, how do we market? anymore, you know, to really make sure that we're reaching everybody, because I always understood that email is still the number one way to do that. But how do we get them to open it up in a world where we are all, you know, me, myself, I get 200 plus emails a day. So, you know, yeah, major struggles in how to reach, reach our members, our donors. Definitely. We had a couple of comments in the chat too, just with being in the office um, when you have a very hands-on organization, so not being on the field makes it really challenging to market. Um, and then just updating your website and social media, but navigating all of those changing rules and posting, um, finding the right tools to use to keep the social media presence. All of those are great, um, great and very real challenges that we're all going through. These are some of the top struggles that we here when Glenn and I are meeting with organizations and you guys have some really specific ones, which I love because it shows that you know your organization and you know what your struggles are. And these are some of the ones that we, we hear from all of the organizations that we meet with. There's just not enough time. Um, no, you might not be where, you might not be sure where to start, not enough money in the budget if you're trying to promote certain posts. Um, and then not sure just where to dedicate your time and energy because you only have so much of it in the day. So all of these struggles, I wanna give them space to acknowledge like they exist, they are real, and they're things that we just kind of have to own when we have smaller teams and figure out, uh, figure out how to navigate those and get the most out of what we're doing. So when it comes to maximizing your online presence, I always like to think of the quote, you can do anything, but not everything. I'm like, I'm very type A, my achiever is my biggest strengths and strength finders. I'm sure most of you run into that as well, where you want to do everything and you know you can take it on, but you can't do everything well at the same time. And that's something we also want to acknowledge here. We're trying to maximize what you're doing well and focus on that rather than trying to do everything. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just building your roadmap. And this is just a simple exercise of just starting somewhere. Um, a lot of you might go through some similar exercises in your organizations, but this is specifically to your marketing, your website, and figuring out where you're even trying to go. So first step, identify what you struggle with and what's working well. I think that's very important to figure out the wins, know where you're actually doing a good job and then struggles. So you can kind of balance your time and energy between amplifying those and also continuing to work on making progress there. Second step, figure out where you want to interact with people online. I always tell people if your audience is not there and you don't like the platform, don't use it. Don't bother. Um, Twitter is my personal favorite example because I don't like Twitter, I don't have Twitter, and it's not something that I find a lot of audiences that we work with are present on. Now, if your audience is present there and you don't like it, that's a different story. You sometimes have to overcome that, but I always say, just own it. If you don't like it, if it's not where your audience is living, just leave it, push it aside. That's not where you need to put your time and energy. Uh, step three, establish what you want your visitors to do and what actions you want them to take. So it sounds very straightforward, but if they come to a page on your website or if they look at a social media post and you're not really sure what you what action you want them to take on that, it's not performing as well as it could be. So make it super easy and clear what you want them to do, whether that's on your website, blog post, social media, email marketing figure out what action you're trying to get them to take and make that like the easiest thing that they can ever find. And step four, figure out what success and failure looks like for your organization. 
So what, what does a successful interaction look like? Does that mean they've reached out to you, submitted their information, um, sent you an email, opened up your email? There's a lot of different ways you can look at that. Um, but also what does failure look like? So if they don't open your email, if they don't, you know, click this button to donate, what does that failure space look like as well? And then some things to keep in mind with goals or building your roadmap. These become the places where you put your time and energy. This is where you really are going to be able to allocate your resources. Um, they're your priorities for budgeting, your time, your money, uh, and your marketing efforts. And you can make these as specific or as general as you want to. I'll show you a couple examples from a nonprofit that I'm, I just started working with in the last couple of weeks. But you can make these really big or really small, depending on you know, how you're coming along with your overall goals. And another thing I like to point out, goal setting can be really stressful. Building a strategy can also be really stressful, especially if you're not comfortable in that space or if you don't have a lot of time. So a couple of things to just acknowledge to like leave it on the table. Don't worry about it. Know that your goals are going to be different for every organization. So something that works for your friend that runs this nonprofit or this business might be very different from what you want to focus on. And that is perfectly fine. Uh, your goals might change throughout the year. So depending on how, I know a lot of you mentioned youth programs that are starting, your summer goals might be very different from what your goals are in the winter. Uh, you're not going to be successful at every single platform or every single strategy. We can all let that go. That's an important reminder that I often need is you're not going to be good at everything. Let's not try. Let's focus our energy on being realistic, keeping your expectations fluid, um, I always like to recommend just organizing the chaos. So getting some time to sit down and just start big, get a little bit smaller. So what are your big things that you can accomplish, uh, and map those out. And then there might be some more specific things underneath that, but making a list is often the best way to start doing this. And then don't, don't overthink it. You just pick, pick a place to start. You can pivot later, but as long as you've got something that you're making progress towards, you're going to be fine. So this is an example roadmap from a nonprofit foundation that I uh, started working with on a website project a couple weeks ago. Not going to name names, but they're kind of a good case study example for this roadmap. So when they're looking at what's working well, they know they love their vision and mission. They've got a lot of expertise to share, um, but they don't have a website. So there's really nowhere to share it yet. And they struggle with dedicating team resources to their own marketing, and they don't have a website to even promote their foundation. Uh, where do they want to interact with people online? So they've got a few different target audiences. They've got high school students who are signing up for their educational program. They also have donors that are donating to the program and then some school counselors in between. So rather than focusing on only targeting high school students where they might be more on like TikTok or Instagram or Snapchat, they don't know those platforms very well. So they're focusing on some that are going to meet those audiences in the middle with their website, Facebook, and LinkedIn to kind of target where all three of those audiences intersect. And then what actions do they want them to take? They wanna reach out for more information so they can start the conversation, actually sign up for the program or make a donation. Uh, step four, what does success look like? Con connecting with potential students and donors. Uh, and then failure, they don't have enough donations to fund the program, they don't have enough students to sign up. So you can kind of see how that starts to fit together as you go through this exercise on your own with your own organization. And so this is their starting point. They obviously need to start really big, starting to create the website itself. Uh, they don't even have a platform to talk about the program or take donations yet. So that's where we're starting at the very top of the funnel. Next step is develop the content. So funneling your, their vision and mission and their uh, program information all into content that we can use on their website, their social media and future content, whether that's email marketing or blog posting, all of that can happen simultaneously. You can also just table some of those ideas for later content, but at least you have that sort of in mind. We'll talk a little bit about planning out your content too. Uh, connecting with potential students and donors. So we're continuing to get a little bit more specific here. Once they develop the content to use that on their website and their social media, they can start to use that to speak to potential students and donors. 
right now. They just don't even have like a, a, a medium to be able to connect with anyone. And then their really specific goal, driving donations from the website. So obviously starting big, getting very small and that those donations. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, their donations will actually drive like signing up for the program. So that'll actually get them started. So you guys have 15 seconds. Think about your top three goals for connecting with your users online. You can go into this more in depth um, on your own later, but we can either shout it out, put it in the chat, just one or two goals that you're thinking about right now. And you can always get more specific with it later. Does anyone have anything right off the top of their head? You want us to answer this question, the top three goals? Yeah, just any, if you can have oh. one, that's totally fine. Uh, right. Laura said yeah. getting out program information. I think that's a great start. Our, mine would be to book or donate. <clears throat> awesome. Anybody else, one more? Um, I think ours at Sissel um, and Laura had said the same thing is um, how to get our program information out there more than we already are. Awesome. And then connecting with donors, volunteers, and driving awareness, which are all great too. Thank you all for sharing. So it seems like we're kind of taking a step back. I, you guys will obviously already know a lot of like who you're talking to, but I think that part of this exercise that's important is taking a step back to make sure you're focusing on the right things first. Sometimes you might find that there's stuff you can throw out, get rid of, and then refocus your efforts. Uh, Jordan also said just reaching more people, getting more people to donate or support the program and sharing posts with others. All of those are really great and specific as well. So thank you guys for sharing. Um, obviously we have two sides to our business. We've got the website where we've actually are, we're working with clients on their website presence specifically. And then we also have the digital marketing where the website's one component of that marketing. It's one arm to that, that marketing toolkit. Um, so managing your content, I think from all the nonprofits I work with has been one of the biggest challenges and what even goes into this. Um, when you're talking about managing your content, this is primarily on your website, but you also push out content in other ways as well. So specifically with your website, just organizing it effectively, creating a structure for your website content that helps with search rankings, drives user experience and successful interactions, um, optimizing your visuals, images and videos can take you a long way with content as well. Um, and then regularly updating evergreen content, which evergreen content for those of you who are like, what does that even mean? <laughs> it's, it's the content that's, uh, that stays static. That's pretty much going to stay the same, stay accurate for a while. Um, it's the stuff that doesn't change terribly often, but you can go in and keep, make sure it's updated as your organization changes. So a couple tools that we have that are really helpful if you haven't heard of these. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went through a training in the brand or the story brand framework. Um, we've sort of reimagined this as the brand story, but this is a framework that um, I'll put the link in here in just a second, but it basically puts your end user in the driver's seat. So rather than talking about what your organization does for them, you imagine it from the perspective of your core audience, core audience members. So if you're someone who's visiting your organization for the first time, what problems do they have? How do you help solve them? Um, what does success and failure look like for that relationship? And how does a successful interaction help them transform from working with your organization? Oftentimes we talk about like our organizations and just throw information at people because we want to explain what we do rather than saying, okay, here's who you are. Here's how what your problems are, I can solve them. Um, we, and we also use this to organize content, create the correct voice and tone. You can use this in marketing materials, email marketing, social media. It's a really good framework to just help drive that process, not just for your website. 
So the story brand framework comes up in all sorts of popular movies, TV shows, books. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about it, just go to storybrand.com. They have a bunch of free resources. They have an awesome podcast that you can listen to. Um, they have some blog articles with how to use it, but it's really interesting, especially if you're interested in like telling the story of your organization and how it relates to uh, people that you work with. So another good way to organize your content is just creating a sitemap. So even if you have an existing website that has a sitemap, this is like the visual representation of all of your pages, features on the website and content that you're covering. And so a lot of times if you have an existing website um, or any of our clients that we work with, when they have an existing website, we start with a sitemap to map out everything they have and we can move things around. So if we realize that this page is not getting enough traffic because of where it's located, we can move it and make sure that's a little bit more obvious where that content is and make sure people are finding it. So I would say whether you redid your website last week or whether you built it five years ago, this is a good exercise just to have this. Um, you can visually move things around and figure out if the information that you have on your site makes sense where it's at. So these can start out as sticky notes. Um, they can be a whiteboard drawing. You can also move these into a digital format. And then I recommend just referencing this once you start to create a task list and figure out what you need to tackle. Uh, we use a tool called Miro for building out workflows and sitemaps. Um, it, they've got free options, so uh, just a great tool in general. They also have some paid options. Uh, they have templates that you can use too if you're not sure exactly like how you wanna build out your workflow. So I highly recommend checking that out. And then along with the sitemap, another really core thing is just how do we want people to take action? So have you built out a user journey or a workflow to figure out who's the user, what are the steps they're going to take to get to that end goal? So this is very similar to a sitemap. It's a visual map of how users will flow throughout the website. Um, and you can use this to inform either design changes you need to make, new pages, content structure, um, all that good stuff. You can also use Miro for this too, if you if you aren't sure kind of what tool to use, but it's a really good uh, really good tool just to make sure that you're sending people in the correct direction. Another really important piece of content management is the visuals that you have to go along with your content. So when it comes to visuals, you want high quality visuals and you want them to complement all of the content you have on the site. So whether that's stock photos or personal photography, um, videography, graphics or icons are also a great way to kind of add those on without having it be, you know, photography specifically, and then illustration. So if you have um, someone that you work with that can do illustration, that's a great way to add some kind of custom touch to your branding. Um, the illustrations you see on the right hand side, these are all animations that we did for uh, an auto repair company here in town, but they wanted something that was a little bit more unique that illustrated their process. And it, we ended up creating some of these, but you can also purchase stock icons. You can purchase stock illustrations. There, there's a lot of good options too, if you're looking for something that's not fully customized, but is just kind of dabbling and getting you a little bit more um, personality outside of images. And then you really wanna focus on balancing performance versus quality. So size images appropriately for their frame, optimize them for web, compress them where you, where you can. Um, anytime you have large images or media on your site, they're huge contributor, contributors to poor site speed. And if you're worried about people not taking action on your site, a lot of times it has to do with how fast your site is loading and if it's performing the way that people are expecting. So that's another good thing to look at if you're feeling like people aren't spending time on your site or they're not taking action where they need to, double check your site speed and performance there. So another thing, once you have all of these laid out for your content, going through all of your content can be a huge pain. It doesn't have to be, but it can definitely be a huge pain. Um, benefits of going through all of your content on your website, Google and other search engines absolutely love content that's recently updated. They know when you've updated your content and they view that as someone who cares about their website, who wants their information to be relevant, and they will prioritize those sites in search results. Lots of, lots of benefits there. Um, 
We recommend auditing evergreen content that doesn't usually change every quarter just to make sure it's still accurate. Uh, we, for all of our digital marketing campaigns, we do that on their website by default at least once a quarter. Um, you can also add new pages in if you feel like you need to, but sometimes you're like, I don't have a lot of content that's changing. Going through and just refreshing it and auditing it to make sure that it's up to date is still a really great exercise. Um, and then organizing your content audit, use your sitemap, use your user journeys, um, and then create a spreadsheet with all of your pages from your sitemap just to include notes and information on when they were last updated. So a quick little example, and like I said, I have an example template for content calendar, um, content audit spreadsheets, and a social media calendar that I can share with you guys um, after this presentation. It has a template, you can just duplicate it and use it however you'd like. Um, but I feel like sometimes having a starting point is helpful just to get started on these. So for content audits, it seems pretty straightforward, but just creating a spreadsheet with your page name, your URL, when it was updated, what changed during that update, what are your focus keywords, and then what are your actions you're asking users to take. Just mapping that out even helps you keep it more organized. You can give this as a tool to other team members when they start taking things over. It's a good, really sustainable tool. So part of this is also planning out new content. So once you've got your static or evergreen pages organized, really up to date, you can also start adding new content on. So whether that's on social media or email or your blog posting or all three and just using one topic for all of those, uh, you wanna create a content calendar to organize those efforts. So I find content calendars are challenging to put together at the beginning, but once you've got a good flow and you're working through it, um, you can organize your upcoming content. So then you can map it out what you have to create and when. Um, or who's responsible for getting you content to push out there. So you can also include like overall marketing goals, your target audiences, and like the purpose for each platform in that same document. Again, it's really helpful to share that with other team members or you know, interns if you're working with those in your organization. Um, and I also have a starter template for you guys. So I'll send that out. But essentially it's got different tabs to map out what you would put in each column there are content calendar tools that you can use. We've tested out probably like 10, I think at this point, um, a lot of them are paid. So if you're just starting out and trying to figure out, you know, what content do I have coming up? A spreadsheet is going to work just great for you guys um, to be able to add more detail, put your content in and map out your dates too. And from here, I'm going to kick it over to Glenn. He's going to talk a little bit more about maximizing your SEO and um, some free tools that you can use. Great, thanks Lindsay. So a lot of what Lindsay talked about is really some of the initial phases, especially on the website to make sure you have all the user journeys mapped out, the site maps, um, so that people can find what they're looking for. They know where to sign up to volunteer, to donate, whatever your uh, main points uh, and calls to action are. Um, search engine optimization or SEO is another major point when we're talking about how are people even finding up, out about you when they search Google, when they're looking for volunteer opportunities or they're looking for uh, local nonprofits to donate to, um, making sure that your website can even get found in the first place. So um, the, there are a few things that we like to look at when we're uh, organizing an SEO campaign. And that's first doing some keyword research, finding out what your visitors are searching for um, in the first place. So uh, identifying those top keywords, usually I like to start with a list of 25 to 50 keywords that um, I wanna go after and target, where if people Google you know, uh, a two or three word key phrase uh, that you wanna show up you know, in the top at least on the top page, if not in the top two or three uh, uh, spots on Google. Uh, so really looking at the, uh, the, those what I call high value keywords with high search volume, but they're not overly uh, competitive. So you want to look at um, how many people are searching for this and how many other uh, websites are ranking. So if it's something that Wikipedia is ranking for on number one, 
and then you've got a whole uh, bunch of other just major players out there, you're probably not going to be able to rank uh, on the first page for those very high co uh, competition keywords. Um, later on, on a, a separate slide, we've got a free keyword research tool that you can use to sort of analyze where your website shows in comparison to certain key uh, keywords and, and searches. So really, it's a balancing act between um, how competitive the keyword is and how much search volume there is. Uh, you want to make sure that there's enough traction to go after those, uh, but not enough competition to not be able to realistically rank. Uh, there is a difference. I, you may have heard of a term called short tail and long tail keywords. Uh, short tail are usually one or two words uh, where, uh, for example, nonprofit or Des Moines nonprofit, uh, that'd be a short tail keyword where it, it, it's relatively difficult to uh, rank just because every other website that has the word nonprofit on their uh, website is trying to rank for that as well. So we typically recommend going after what are called long tail keywords. These are usually five, four or five or six uh, words, more of a key phrase that people are searching for where um, you, you have a lot higher chance of ranking for those. So for example, if you're in the mental health uh, industry, uh, as it were, for, um, for your nonprofit, then you would go after a long tail keyword like uh, volunteer for a mental health nonprofit in Des Moines, you know, almost like a, a, a fragmented site, a sentence that you're going after to be able to target that key phrase that people do search for. Um, and then you may end up being number one or number two in Google search results rather than just mental health nonprofit. Uh, that would be a lot harder to, uh, to rank for because there are so many national organizations, regional organizations, and so on uh, that you're going to be competing with. Uh, another thing to look for are what are called featured snippets. So you've probably seen these when you do a uh, Google search. There's that big box at uh, the top of search results where if you ask a question, uh, oftentimes Google will just pull one answer um, into, the, into a box and that's called a featured snippet. And those oftentimes get triggered when you ask Google uh, a question. So uh, for example, where can I volunteer in Des Moines? Uh, where what local nonprofits can I donate to, uh, things like that. So uh, creating content around those featured snippets is another um, thing that we do in regards to SEO and keyword research to be able to create content that's going to fill that box. Uh, so very often if you find these questions have boxes, almost writing an answer for those questions that you see in search results, to be able to uh, rank a little bit more competitively uh, in those featured snippets. The other thing you have to evaluate is really the search intent. So if people in the area are looking for a place to donate or volunteer, uh, or if you're looking for awareness, just get information. What are the questions that people are asking about, about your nonprofit or your uh, market segment? So really, figuring out what the ultimate goal of that search is, whether they're looking to donate or volunteer, or they're just looking for information. Both of those are very valuable actions to be able to say, hey, I'm just trying to inform the public. If they end up donating, great, but very often part of your mission statement is just to uh, inform and give resources to the community. And if you uh, can find that search intent, craft content around that intent to be able to give the valuable information to, to the users. Because one of Google's ranking factors is, did the person end up finding the piece of inf information that they're looking for? And if they didn't go to your site and then immediately bounce back to the Google search results, you're gonna be rewarded for that. If they end up uh, dwelling, it's called dwell time, dwelling on your website, reading the content, and, and that seems to be valuable for them. So the last thing is, how can you make their search easier? On that landing page, if they go to your website, those call to actions that Lindsay was talking about, making sure that there's a clear, concise uh, action that you're driving people to so that you're guiding them through that whole process. They get the information, maybe at the end of uh, a paragraph or at the end of the page, you have you know, a downloadable a PDF to you know, it's a takeaway that they can print out or just save to their computer that's valuable to them, 
or if they're looking to donate, having a clear donate button, volunteer button, a, a contact form, uh, something like that. So just making that user journey a little bit easier uh, is going to be rewarding as well. So another thing that I like to look at when it comes to search engine optimization is looking at what your quote unquote competitors are doing. Now in the nonprofit world, I know we don't like to compete with each other. We're all friends. Um, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but what I uh, deem as competitors are really, you know, look at Minneapolis, Kansas City, Omaha, similar organizations um, in your realm and see what they're doing. Um, that's, that's what I like to do with nonprofits is and not looking at a competitor in Des Moines because, you know, uh, oftentimes you collaborate with one another, but see what's working in other markets. So um, I always like to pull up five or six different regional cities uh, in the Midwest or even on the coast to see you know, what's going well in Indianapolis and what, how can we implement those strategies in Des Moines. So just spending some time uh, to be able to um, poke around and, and view their web presence. Are the things that you like about their website? Are there any things you dislike about their website? Is their content easy to use, understand? Do they have resources that you really like and that you could implement on your website as well? Um, their branding, uh, their call to actions, all of those things are, are things to really just evaluate. We're not stealing any trade secrets here. It's just sort of evaluating what they're doing well and how you can maybe implement some of those uh, tactics on your website or your uh, web presence. This doesn't just fall to uh, a website either. Um, this can be about blogs or even on social media. Um, so if you look at their Facebook or LinkedIn pages, you can learn a lot of great things and oftentimes collaborate with one another too. say, hey, we've got this partnership with uh, an organization in Chicago. They've, they're much bigger than us, but we're learning quite a bit from them, uh, for example, or sign up for their newsletters. Uh, that's another great way is, you know, you're interested and you want to learn from them. So sign up uh, for their MailChimp or their constant contact uh, list and see what news are they sending out? What, how are they driving those actions, the volunteer, the donations? Um, and you can really learn a lot from those, quote, competitors that you're not really competing against. It's just learning from. When it comes to the content on your website, there are hundreds of different things that Google looks at for ranking factors. And it's impossible to get every single one of those perfect. But I just pulled out three that I feel like are the easiest and most important to do uh, when it comes to optimizing your content on your website. Uh, the first one is adding custom page titles and meta descriptions. So this is almost one of the first things that Google looks at when it looks at a page is what's the title and what's the description that it's going to pull out and, and display on a Google search result. Now, by default, Google just sort of crawls uh, web pages and pulls out um, a title and auto generates a description, but there is a way to actually set a custom page title and meta description on most websites, whether it's Wix, Squarespace, or a custom uh, website, other uh, areas to enter these. And this is where you want to put in keyword rich titles and descriptions for uh, those Google crawlers and, and Bing crawlers to make sure they have a little bit more context about what's on your website. So. Um, if you're a nonprofit in central Iowa, you probably want to add, you know, X type of nonprofit Des Moines, Iowa or central Iowa, something like that to give it a little bit more context. Uh, and you get about 60 characters to play around with on the page title. Uh, so you can, you can fit quite a bit in that page title uh, rather than just homepage uh, or uh, the name of your organization. You want to add a little bit more context for Google to, to pull out there. Same goes with the description. Um, this is really encouraging a click-through uh, from, from Google. So when we talk about click-through rate, uh, how many people does, the, does your website display to and what percentage of those people actually click through to your website? And so the description really provides a, a more context both for Google and for the user to know, okay, what can I expect on this web page? Is this the one I'm looking for? Um, and you can put in great keywords in there as well. Um, and you get about 160 characters to play around with um, on the description. So that's the first thing that I look at. The next is a clear 
heading structure. So this, is, this goes back a little bit to what Lindsay was talking about with the sitemap. Uh, a heading structure is almost like an outline for a web page. So what information, you've got all your information on the, on the page, how do you want it organized? I always like to think of it like an outline where you've got your main points, maybe a title, and then two or three main points. Those would be considered heading twos, H2s on the website. And if you use Word or Google Docs, for example, uh, you may have seen this in action when you organize a, a document as well. This is exactly how Google reads your website as well. So if you tag it correctly using that logical heading structure with you know, two or three H2s, heading twos, few uh, H3s underneath that. There may be an H4, the heading four, just depending on the content. Using those tags is going to give a lot of context to Google about how the website is organized and uh, how it relates to everything else. The last thing that uh, we talked about is just creating that keyword rich content. So in the SEO world, that search engine optimization world, we always say content is king. So the more content you have on your website, the more context you can give to Google, the better. And oftentimes, you know, a lot of people say, well, how much content can I really put on a, on a contact page? Probably not a whole lot of uh, uh, words go onto a contact page, but that can be um, really supplemented by some of the services pages or an about page or on blogs. So uh, a really great way to beef up your website's content is to create a, um, monthly or you know bi-monthly or uh, just a regular blogging schedule google loves fresh and relevant content and so just posting on a regular basis is going to uh, increase the average word count on on your website we typically shoot for around thousand words per page uh plus or minus now obviously some pages are going to be way less than that so uh, the contact page for example you don't want to clutter that up you really only want your address, your phone number, uh, how to get a hold of you, but then supplement that with uh, some of the other pages um, and try to get uh, close to a thousand words. Sometimes that's really tough, but um, that, can, that can be supplemented with in, in certain ways. Free tools. We all love free tools. Uh, <laughs> there, there are great resources out there, especially for small businesses, nonprofits uh, that you can use most tools on the internet have a free version that then you can upgrade when you get to a certain size. If you know, you're an enterprise user, you have 20 different people logging in. At that point, typically you do have to upgrade, but there's so many tools out there that are free, uh, especially if you're a one or two person team that's managing the marketing or managing um, your, your web presence that we recommend. So the first one here is Google My Business. You probably, Seen this, most of you I hope have claimed this uh, profile. This is if you Google your name, it shows up on the right-hand side of a Google search result. And it also shows up on Google Maps. Uh, that's what controls your Google Maps listing. Um, and this is where you can set your hours, your phone number, your contact information, uh, where you can get reviews and, and respond to those reviews. So this is really important uh, to make sure that it's claimed and optimized uh, just so that Google has more um, relevance to who you are, what you do, and where you do it. Those are sort of the key things that Google looks for. Um, and, and it really helps uh, people who are looking for an organization or trying to learn about your organization get in touch. So they'll be able to click through to your website. They'll be able to click uh, for directions if, you, if it is a place that you drive to, uh, click to call. Um, and, and really, you can get analytics from this as well in the back end to see, okay, how many people last quarter called me from my Google profile? How many people got directions uh, to my uh, nonprofit last quarter? Things like that. Another great way uh, thing about this is you can add tons of pictures. So if it's something where, you know, hopefully the summer you have volunteer opportunities again, and you have groups coming in, adding pictures to your Google My Business profile is a great way to show, hey, this is what a typical um, experience volunteering at our organization looks like, that people can click through and you see a bunch of smiles uh, on their faces and, and it's a really good place to add those. 
Next one here uh, is Google Analytics. Uh, this is something that gives you data and, and analytics on your website. So it's a free tool from Google uh, that you can then track how many users go to your website. Where do they come from? Is it from uh, Des Moines? Is it from Iowa? Is it from the Midwest? Is it from abroad? Um, but it also gives you a lot of information about the channels they use. So you can actually walk it back and see, hey, I had 25% of my visitors coming from social media last month. That's awesome. You know, let's continue that social media campaign and post more and try to get more traffic. Or you can see um, people from, from organic, from Google, spent three times longer, three times more time on my website than people who came from, from Facebook. So sort of uh, figuring out why are people uh, from, from Google spending so much more time on my website? Are they finding better information? Uh, it just gives you a lot of insight. I could spend hours and <laughs> you probably could too, just diving through Google Analytics. Um, I'm a very data-driven and analytical person. So it, this, that's, that's fun for me. But um, there are some really interesting insights that you can discern from Google Analytics just by uh, installing it on your website and tracking. Uh, tracking those website users uh, from start to finish. Glenn, do you want to mention GA4? Sure. Uh, so Google Analytics, they recently, just in October, upgraded to a new version. So if some of you are used to uh, Google Analytics and haven't logged in recently, they just upgraded. Um, part of this is due to um, some of the, the new uh, privacy regulations that are happening in Europe and California, um, but they, they are switching eventually to this Google Analytics 4 version, uh, which this is a screenshot of uh, that you can see. Um, they haven't said when they're going to retire the old Google Analytics, but we urge everybody to uh, just upgrade the account uh, to, to Google Analytics 4. The old one is sticking around uh, for now, but uh, just so you can start tracking data in the new analytics is, is a good idea. Uh, another free tool here from Google is Google Search Console. I'm not sure if anybody's played around with this before. This is where I start most of my keyword research journeys. Um, we have a couple other agency tools that are, that are paid. This one's free, so that's why I love it, and I usually start here. This is where you can see how your website performs on Google.com. So essentially, uh, you can see what people Google, what people search for, over the last month, three months, 12 months, and it gives you measurement protocols as far as um, the performance of impressions, clicks, click-through rate, and average position. Um, and so I always like to look, when I was talking about the uh, high search volume keyword, this is where I start. You can go into the uh, performance metrics here and see uh, sort by uh, impressions. That's how many people uh, basically the number of searches essentially that are uh, happening for, for that keyword. Uh, and then it sort of sorts by also click through rate. So you can see uh, what keywords don't really perform very well that aren't getting clicked, but have a lot of searches and vice versa, which ones are getting a lot of clicks despite having few uh, searches. Uh, so this is, this is usually how I like to go and start that. You can also, in the queries section, uh, add a filter. So I always like to look at what questions people are searching. So you can search for the question words, who, what, how, can, should, um, those types of words where you can actually see what are people Googling uh, that my website is relevant about. And, and that's always very interesting. So a big part in, uh, especially nonprofit, is, is Facebook and LinkedIn uh, as well, um, making sure that you're utilizing those. Um, Lindsay mentioned some content uh, calendars, planning out those posts. That's a really good place to start. Uh, a couple things I wanted to talk about as well are uh, the Facebook Pixel and Facebook Analytics, two um, tools that they have access to. So um, the Facebook Pixel, is something that you can use both for tracking and advertising. So if you do have an advertising budget, I'd highly recommend getting the Facebook Pixel installed. Um, what it does is it, it, 
you install it on your website and it basically tracks visitors to your website. And from there, you can do what's called retargeting. So if they visit your website, you can hit them then uh, with a Google ad or uh, excuse me, a Facebook ad um, because you know that they've interacted with your website or your post. So you can then sort of follow them around on Facebook a little bit. I'm sure you all get ads <laughs> like that on Facebook all the time or Instagram. Um, another thing you can do with the Facebook pixel is audience building. So if you know these uh, 100 people have gone to your website in the last uh, month, then you can build an audience from those people and say, these are the people that are high engagement, they interact with my website, I'd like to target them in a certain way and say, you know, have, have a set of ads thanking them or have a set of ads uh, urging them to volunteer. Um, if they've gone to your volunteer page, you can create an audience just based off of people who have visited a, one certain page on your website, things like that. And then uh, to go a step further, you can create what's called a lookalike audience. So that's going to be telling Facebook, okay, we know we've got these 100 people, find a thousand other people that look like them. They're in the Des Moines area um, and they behave simil similarly or they have similar demographics. Um, that's, it doesn't exactly tell you who's in that audience, but it, it creates a, what's called a lookalike audience to uh, target people who look like the people you already have captured. So that's a really powerful tool uh, that you can use on social media. Uh, unfortunately, you can't use it when you're posting organically, uh, but it does come into play when you're posting or, or using advertising. So if you have a small or large advertising budget, uh, you can use those, those uh, lookalike audiences or different audiences that, um, that can be used in targeting. Uh, the last thing it can do that's really uh, fun is look at conversion data. So you can actually tag your website and say, you know, track people who have uh, performed certain valuable actions on my site, whether it's clicks, form submissions, uh, phone calls, donations. Um, under the analytics section, I've got some more, some checkouts, add to cart, initiate checkout, um, donate. Those are all uh, things that you can use uh, on the Facebook pixel for advertising. And then the analytics side, it's similar to Google Analytics. It just gives you insights into what people are doing uh, with those things that you've tagged. Um, so not just page views, but uh, whether they've clicked the donate button, whether they've clicked the contact page, whether they've downloaded that, that um, case study, uh, you can track all of those things and, and have analytics um, attached to that. Uh, the last thing here is LinkedIn. This is actually, and you mentioned Jacob Rep's going to be coming in a future month, a great tool that I, I also agree is hugely underutilized um, both in the for-profit and nonprofit world. Um, it's a great way to connect with people, to network, to uh, share news about your organization. It's a lot more professional network. So um, compared to Facebook and Instagram, you're taking out all of the posts about people's kids, their pets, their food that they're cooking. And it's really just a, a much more professional network to say, I'm here on LinkedIn to connect to peers, in the Des Moines area that I'd like to, you know, eventually work with, or maybe uh, they um, have some volunteers that they'd like to uh, uh, work at some point throughout the year. So it's a really good network to share some of that news that you've got about your organization or updates or just wins. I love seeing positivity, all the, all the wins on LinkedIn to see, wow, this group of 10 people went to, um, the, this organization and volunteered, they gave up two or four hours of their day as a group and they volunteered and you end up reaching hundreds of professionals uh, in and out of your network. Uh, LinkedIn actually sh uh, shares a lot more of people who you're not friends or connected with. So you'll end up seeing something that, you know, I'm connected to Lindsay and one of her contacts in her network posted something really cool. I may end up actually seeing that uh, person's post. And so it's a really uh, uh, powerful networking tool to, to uh, increase your presence in the community. So I'd highly recommend uh, if you're going to choose any uh, social media channels to consider LinkedIn, because 
uh, it's a very powerful um, professional network. Uh, advertising too, you can advertise on, on LinkedIn. It's a little bit more expensive than Facebook, uh, but it has a super powerful uh, AI. Uh, they're owned by Microsoft and we all know Microsoft, Facebook, Google, they know everything about us. Uh, so you can target uh, based off of job title, the industry that people work in, the size of a company, connections, if you're connected, first, second, third connection to them, uh, has similar audience building as, as Facebook. Um, so uh, it, it's another great place to advertise on if you have the budget. Um, and a lot of people think it's just for hiring. It's not, it's also just for uh, advertising some of your professional posts um, that will get a pretty good reach. And with that, Lindsay and I wanted to leave a few minutes here at the end if people have questions either about their website, about their social media presence or anything digitally um, that she and I will be able to address and answer uh, hopefully here in the next, I don't know how much time we have Trish, but uh, 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 the next few minutes. We have about 10 minutes if people have questions they want to ask directly. Great. Um, this is Jane again from Stowe Heights. Um, one of our challenges is being a nonprofit is um, having a volunteer or someone help us set up the site and that handoff to us then managing it. Um, and so I'm looking for resources or suggestions on how best to bridge that gap. <laughs> Cause I think that's where we mostly struggle. We do things in spurts when we have volunteers and then there's just not the consistency. And in long term, it's probably that we need to hire a staff that knows that in and out and is designated as part of their job. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that so is it just mainly maintaining the website that you struggle with, like when there's that handoff from, you know, temporary volunteers or employees? Yes. Yeah, they know it really well. They set it up very nicely. And then it does definitely need to be updated. And then we were like, oh, don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would recommend, depending on the specific volunteer or employee, um, have them create an admin guide. So depending on how they set it up, they can do a screen recording of the training that they do with you during the handoff, or they can create like a collaborative document with screenshots on how to do popular things. So you could even have like, here's the actions that we want to know how to do. Um, and they could map out all the steps to do those. I also think if they're updating content like that, that content audit spreadsheet is going to be your best friend where they can make notes on when they make changes and what they changed. Um, just so you have a record of it. But I would say that anytime you can record or create like a, a document, you can go reference later for uh, answering questions on how to do specific actions. Um, that's going to be your best bet there. we create those um, a lot of times when we launch websites, just people, it's easy to forget if you're not in there every single day, like it's definitely easy to forget. So if they have like custom actions that they've set up, so you need to know how to like upload a report or add a photo or post a blog, those are all good things that they can basically just write out instructions for. But that's probably what I would recommend just to make sure you have documentation later, whether that employee is temporary or permanent. Thank you. Do you have okay. a recommend, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Jane. Okay. Do you have a recommendation on how often to update your site just to, for traffic purposes? So updating like content, updating design. Like yeah, it, it, I mean, you can get a really good site set and then is that good enough and traffic will flow or, or is there any connection to the updates you make that drive people back to the website? Yeah, I would say the worst thing you can do with a website, it's great if you have one, but the worst thing you can do is just set it and forget it. That it doesn't typically lead to success when it comes to a website. Uh, SEO in particular, when you're optimizing to show up more organically is a very ongoing cumulative process. 
Um, the other fun challenge that the internet likes to throw at us is that things change all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so there's going to be times where you have to update related to one of those changes, but you also just want to make sure you're, you're staying in touch with your website. So whether that's your quarterly content audits, posting regular blogs, switching out your photos when you share news, whatever that looks like for you. I think that it's making some time every week to sort of reconnect with your website is going to help you remember what you need to do on it and how to do it. And then also just make sure you're making little gradual changes rather than being like, I haven't looked at it in 12 months and now it's this huge project. Um, it keeps things in more manageable pieces. Thank you. But I would also say like if you have a framework that you like being able to change out content and update photos in particular is like a good way to do that rather than like redesigning the whole thing. Um, this is Kate with Anna Wim. Um, do you have a recommendation for how often you should be doing LinkedIn and Facebook posts? Um, I mean, I, I, I know that you should probably be doing fairly consistently. It's just, um, that can become very overwhelming when you're also doing marketing and so many other aspects within a nonprofit. So just kind of, what's your recommendation? Yeah, the answer is always, it depends. <laughs> but uh, I, if you've got events going on, so let's say you've got a huge volunteer event, I would love to see posts throughout the weekend of that and, and you know, have, um, have just, ongoing uh, things where people can stay updated, they see everything else. But if it's just a normal month, um, social media management, it takes a huge, people underestimate how much time it really takes to manage those and plan everything out. So I usually recommend once a week or once every couple of weeks. Um, if you've got a lot of things going on, um, you, you may be up to a couple times a week and, and things like that. And then during a major event, uh, posting a lot more frequently, but uh, just to stay active and stay relevant. Um, if I, we have some people uh, who they love Facebook and they love Instagram, they want to post every single day. That's just really difficult to do and really uh, hard to find the time commitment to be able to dedicate to that. So I usually recommend if you can plan it out and let's say there are four or five weeks in a month, come up with four or five really good posts uh, they're going to stay relevant. Um, if you're a little bit bigger organization, that could double and, and you could see, you know, uh, eight to 10 uh, posts a week or, or per month, but um, not to overdo it because people sort of almost get that fatigue of seeing too many posts as well. So uh, just enough one, to, one time uh, every two weeks to a couple times a week is usually the range that we recommend. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I also just put a link to the content calendar um, starter template. It also has content uh, audit template. There's um, a couple other tabs in there too. So you guys can um, download it and use it in Excel. You can also keep a copy and just make a copy of that to use in your Google Sheets. Um, I think it's just view only privileges. So you'll have to download it or make a copy to edit it. But uh, that should give you guys a starting point on you know, how to start filling out a content calendar and things like that. Um, we have about two minutes left. Trish, do you have any, uh, first I want to thank both of you for presenting. Um, I think especially right now with everything that we've been through the past year, the timing couldn't have been better um, for you to be presenting on this. Um, Trish, do you have any last minute updates you want to give as far as the chamber, um, upcoming things that we need to be watching for? Nope, I think I covered it at the beginning. Um, there was a question on whether we will send out the slides and that that will be up to WebSpec if they want to send them to us, then we can absolutely get those out. Um, but no, other than that, of course, the next nonprofit forum, we're just firming up the speaker. It's going to be on staffing development um, for nonprofits. Uh, we're hoping it's going to be West Bank, but no promises. But anyway, that will we'll go back to the third Wednesday of every month as we typically have. Again, this one was a little um, off just because of spring break. So we wanted to make sure that, that, uh, we could get most people on here. So that's it. Thank you right. so much. Glenn yeah. And Lynn. Lynn, yeah. Yeah. Lynn, yeah. Both of you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Anybody else? 
All right. Have a good rest of your week and weekend, everyone. Be safe. Trish, I'll go ahead and send you a copy of the slide deck and a PDF. You can send that out. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.